What if I told you that one of the world's most powerful mines doesn't dig into the earth at all? In fact, you probably drive past it every single day. It's not hidden in mountains or deserts. It's hiding in plain sight, in places we call scrapyards. And here's the twist. Those scrapyards are fueling a steel supply chain bigger than most people can even imagine. Think about it. When a car reaches the end of its life, most of us picture it being dumped somewhere to rust. But that couldn't be further from the truth. Instead, that same car is about to kick off a journey more extraordinary than its first one. From the factory floor to 10 years on the road, a car's story doesn't end when the engine stops turning. In reality, it's just the beginning of its second life. Every year in the United States alone, over 12 million cars are dismantled and recycled. That's 12 million vehicles reborn, not into more cars sitting in dealerships, but into raw steel, aluminum, plastics and glass that pour straight back into our economy. If you stack those cars nose to tail, they'd stretch clear across the continent. But instead of becoming waste, they become the bones of skyscrapers. Now here's the mind bender. When you buy a car for, say, forty dollars or $50,000, what's it actually worth 10 years later when the paint has faded, the engine has coughed its last breath, and the mileage counter has rolled into six digits? You might think it's almost worthless, but in reality, that pile of junk still feeds into a global industry worth over $60 billion every single year. Why? Because up to 75% of a car's entire weight can be pulled apart, recycled, and given new purpose. Steel, aluminum, copper, glass, plastics, even seat fabrics. Nearly everything can be stripped, separated, and reused. And here's where it gets even crazier. Recycling steel from cars uses about 70% less energy than smelting it from iron ore. That means every recycled car doesn't just save space in landfills. It saves enormous amounts of energy, emissions, and money. So how does the process begin? The first thing that happens is actually paperwork. Technicians record the vehicle's identification number, engine details, year of manufacture, and every other detail that determines its future. A working engine, transmission, or even electronic control modules can fetch a small fortune on the used parts market. The interior, seats, dashboards, even airbags, may find their way into another vehicle. That's the first layer of value that gets extracted before the recycling truly begins. But not every car has usable parts. Many come in wrecked from accidents or corroded beyond repair. Those vehicles skip straight to dismantling, where they'll be broken down piece by piece. Either way, by the end of inspection, every vehicle has a clear destination in the recycling chain. And here's something most people don't realize. In the United States, over 95% of retired vehicles go through this system. That makes automobiles the single most recycled consumer product in the entire country. Not soda cans, not plastic bottles, cars. From here on, the process becomes more intense and more dangerous. Because before a car can be stripped for parts or crushed, one critical threat has to be dealt with first, the battery. Before any heavy machinery comes close, recyclers face their first real challenge, the car's power source. Because inside every end-of-life vehicle is a hidden hazard, the battery. For gasoline cars, that usually means a lead-acid battery. Sounds harmless, right? But these things are chemical grenades if handled the wrong way. Acid, lead, and enough stored current to fry a wrench into molten sparks? That's why it's the very first thing to come out. Workers disconnect it with careful precision, lift it out, and send it down a separate stream where nearly every component, from the plastic casing to the lead inside, can be recycled. But if the car is a hybrid or electric vehicle, the stakes climb dramatically. Those massive lithium-ion packs are monsters compared to old-school batteries. Packed with volatile chemicals, they demand strict procedures. Each pack has to be isolated, unbolted with insulated tools, sealed in protective containers, and shipped to specialized facilities designed to handle them. One mistake could mean fire, explosion, or worse. Only after a vehicle is completely cleared of electrical risks can it move forward to the next stage. And that next stage is equally critical. Draining the lifeblood of the car, its fluids. Think about it. Even a rusted, broken-down car sitting in a scrapyard still holds gallons of fuel, oil, 
coolant, and refrigerant. Left untouched, those fluids aren't just wasteful, they're dangerous. Gasoline vapors can ignite. Brake fluid can contaminate soil. Refrigerants can damage the atmosphere. So the car is hoisted onto a platform, secured with hydraulic clamps, and pierced by specialized probes that suck out every last drop. This is the point where the vehicle we once recognized as a car starts to lose its identity. The first targets are usually the wheels. Tires are stripped off and sent down their own recycling path. Then come the windows. With specialized cutting tools, workers slice out the windshields and side glass. Car glass isn't ordinary glass. It's laminated with a thin layer of plastic called PVB, which keeps it from shattering into dangerous shards. Recycling recovers both the glass and the PVB layer, which is later used in soundproofing materials and coatings. Even something as simple as a windshield gets a second life. Next, the doors. They might look like single pieces of metal, but each door is a little ecosystem of parts, steel or aluminum frames, electric window motors, locking mechanisms, and yards of wiring. Each component is carefully stripped out. Copper wiring is pulled for recycling, magnets from motors are collected, and the frames are sent to the furnaces. One by one, the interior follows. Seats, dashboards, carpets, all removed and sorted. Fabrics and plastics are shredded for reuse. Wiring harnesses are stripped for copper, and airbags are carefully extracted, since even inactive ones can pose risks. By this point, the car looks more like a skeleton than a machine. But the heart still remains, the engine and the transmission. These are the heaviest and most valuable mechanical components inside any vehicle. Some are salvaged, refurbished, and sold back into the market. Others are disassembled further to recover steel, aluminum, and copper. Catalytic converters, often overlooked, hold tiny amounts of precious metals like platinum and palladium, metals so valuable that thieves sometimes target them directly. Piece by piece, what was once a fully functioning vehicle is reduced to piles of sorted components, each one on its way to becoming something new. But the car's frame, that heavy, stubborn shell of steel, still stands. And to deal with it, recyclers bring in the big guns. Hydraulic shears powerful enough to rip a vehicle apart like it's made of cardboard. The real destruction is about to begin. By the time a car reaches this stage, it hardly resembles a car at all. The seats are gone, the glass is cut out, the engine has been pulled, and all the small components have been stripped away. What's left is the bare, stubborn frame, a twisted shell of steel and aluminum. And to deal with it, recyclers unleash some of the most brutal machines ever built. The first stop is the rough processing area where hydraulic shears take over. Imagine a pair of mechanical jaws, each bite powered by tens of tons of pressure. These jaws don't just cut, they tear. Within seconds, what's left of the car is ripped apart like a tin can. Exhaust pipes, tangled wiring, even stubborn chunks of plastic are torn out and discarded. The goal here isn't beauty, it's speed, safety, and efficiency, stripping the frame down to pure, smeltable metal. Once the car has been cleaned of anything that could contaminate the furnace, it's time for the most iconic moment of all, the crushing. Massive hydraulic presses line up frame after frame, flattening them with unbelievable force. Picture this, a vehicle that once stretched over four meters in length, longer than some bedrooms, compressed into a dense cube of metal small enough to stack with others like bricks. In just seconds, the car is reduced to a fraction of its original size. Depending on the yard, the crushing can take different forms. Car balers compress frames into tight, cube-shaped bales, compact, dense, and easy to transport. These high-density blocks are designed to fit neatly into shipping containers or stack like building blocks in warehouses. Then there are flatteners, which squash vehicles into thin sheets. They're cheaper, faster, but less space efficient. And finally, shear balers, machines that crush and slice simultaneously, chopping the car into manageable pieces that can be sent straight to smelters. Each method has its trade-offs, but the end result is always the same. A car that once carried families, commuted to work, or raced down highways is reduced to nothing more than uniform chunks of recyclable steel. But the journey doesn't stop at crushing, that's just the prelude. Because the true heart of auto recycling, 
The stage that makes the ground shake is the shredder. Picture this, a block of compressed steel, the remains of an entire car fed into a chamber the size of a house. Inside, enormous rotating shafts bristling with interlocking steel teeth spin in opposite directions. The sound is deafening. Metal collides with metal in a violent storm of sparks. And within seconds, the block is shredded into thousands of jagged fragments. It's industrial violence at its purest, and it happens at staggering speed. A modern shredder can process well over 100 tons of steel per hour. That's hundreds of cars torn apart every single day. What once took a decade to build and years to wear out is obliterated in less time than it takes to drink a cup of coffee. But shredding isn't chaos, it's precision. After the destruction, the fragments roll down sorting lines where magnets snap up carbon steel with incredible accuracy. Eddy currents deflect aluminum and copper to the side, separating them like magic. Even plastics and rubber are pulled away, discarded from the stream. In less than an hour, the remains of a car are neatly divided into pure, reusable materials. And here's the irony. After all this destruction, the car's value actually increases. Those uniform steel fragments are worth far more to industry than the rusty old shell that arrived at the scrapyard. What looked like waste has become wealth, but we're still not finished. The shredded steel can't simply sit in piles. To truly be reborn, it must endure one final fiery trial. The blocks and fragments are shipped to furnaces hotter than volcanoes, where artificial lightning melts them into glowing rivers of liquid metal. That's where the car completes its transformation, and that's where we're headed next. The shredded steel, sorted and bundled into neat blocks, is ready for its final and most dramatic transformation. From here, the journey moves to the steel mill, where mountains of crushed cars are reborn in fire. The core of the process is the electric arc furnace, a chamber so hot it makes volcanoes look tame. Imagine three massive graphite electrodes lowering into the furnace like spears. In an instant, currents of tens of thousands of amps arc between them, unleashing artificial lightning. The roar is deafening, the heat unbearable. Within minutes, the shredded remains of cars glow red, then orange, before melting into a river of liquid steel. At over 1600 degrees Celsius, the furnace turns what was once fenders, bumpers, and chassis into a molten sea of pure potential. Lime and flux are added to pull impurities to the surface, forming a layer of slag. Oxygen lances blast through the mix, burning away unwanted elements. And all the while, sensors track the chemistry with laser precision, making sure the final alloy meets the strict standards of modern industry. It's a violent process, but also one of incredible control. From chaos and scrap, a stream of glowing, purified steel emerges, flowing like lava through sealed channels into the continuous casting line. Here, the liquid steel is poured into water-cooled molds. The outer shell hardens instantly, while the core remains molten, carried forward by rollers that stretch for hundreds of feet. Slowly, the steel cools, solidifying into long billets, massive blocks that can weigh several tons each. Automated saws slice them into segments, each one tagged, scanned, and logged. Just hours ago, these billets were cars. Now they're the building blocks of the modern world. But the journey isn't done. The billets are reheated and fed into rolling mills, where colossal rollers flatten and stretch them into sheets, coils, and beams. Each pass through the mill squeezes and refines the metal, transforming rough blocks into razor-precise materials. High-speed cameras and lasers monitor every millisecond, ensuring the steel emerges flawless. Then comes controlled cooling. Jets of high-pressure water create a white mist, quenching the glowing sheets. Massive fans push cool air across the coils, preventing cracks and preserving the steel's strength. Finally, the steel is inspected with ultrasonic sensors and high-resolution cameras. Only the strongest, most flawless batches move forward, and just like that, what once was a rusting, abandoned car is reborn as brand new material, ready to become a skyscraper skeleton, a bridge's support beams, a ship's hull, or even another generation of automobiles. The cycle is complete. What's remarkable isn't just the science or the scale, it's the philosophy behind it. A car that most people would call junk 
becomes a resource of immense value. Every drain fluid, every stripped tire, every melted fragment of steel contributes to a system that saves energy, reduces pollution, and keeps industries alive. This is why cars are the most recycled consumer product on Earth. More than soda cans, more than plastic bottles, more than paper. And it's why auto recycling isn't just an environmental solution. It's a hidden pillar of the global economy. Think about this. The car you drive today, the one sitting in your driveway, might one day take on a second life as the beams of a new hospital, the frame of a new SUV, or the steel rails of a train carrying thousands of passengers. The story of a car doesn't end when it stops running. It simply shifts into a new chapter. So next time you see a scrapyard filled with old battered vehicles, don't see waste. See the world's largest invisible mine. See an endless cycle of transformation. And maybe, just maybe, see the future.